right there. And, um, I, you know, I've never had a, a problem connecting with him. I, I encourage everyone to, you know, maybe reach out to him and, and seek some of his study. And, and as with most uh, uh, regional curve studies, it's good to get to know the researcher and, and dig into some of the pictures they have. So if, if you find uh, interest or value, uh, more so interest is, and value in, in what he's presenting or otherwise, please feel free to reach out to Trevor. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. All right. Hand off to you, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a couple of things I'll, I'll share with you uh, today. You know, we're going to go into the inspirational side of, uh, of being thankful and stuff, but I'm going to punt a little bit and move this in a little bit different direction because I do like some of the discussions that came up uh, by Morgan and, and Robert related to kind of the channel enlargement. So I'm going to share something in the stream of thankfulness from some folks that have shared with us in the past. Um, so my first, uh, uh, when I started working with Trevor uh, on this regional curve years ago, we, we got placed together by a friend of ours named uh, Brad Fairley and then a common acquaintance named Jack Gorey back in the day. And we were both working at Stantec Consultant. Uh, and at that time, I had people that would label me as, hey, Dave's a geomorphologist. And I would tell people, I'm not a geomorphologist. I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm not really, don't really feel comfortable saying I'm a geomorphologist. And I met Trevor, who was a geomorphologist. And I got a real kick out of talking to him. The one thing that I noticed that was different between Trevor and, and uh, me that came out really quickly is that Trevor was all about looking at um, deposition and scour in a channel uh, and looking at places where we have different deposition and scour. And at that point, this was in 2000 and oh, 2000 and six, maybe, or I don't know. It was a while ago. I can't remember exactly when it was, but, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I was using this term called bankful at the time. Uh, and uh, Trevor had asked me uh, very kindly, well, what exactly do you mean by bankful? And it started me on a, a journey to kind of look at the question of what do I actually mean by bankful? Uh, because up until that point, when I, you know, I'd go to classes and they'd be like, yeah, if you don't know bankful, you don't know much. And they kind of have printed on T-shirts and everything else. And if you don't know bankful, you don't know something. Um and uh, so it really had me look at uh, differently how, what it was that I was looking at to identify bankful on sites than what historically had just been, ha, ah, this is bankful. And of course, you know, I was taught by, hey, you look for scour and deposition, but we always looked at scour and deposition, but then had one point where we automatically said, by golly, that is bankful. Um, and uh, Trevor was really probably the first person I worked with that uh, um, helped me look at an idea and encouraged me to look at something and say, okay, well, this is if this is deposition, then maybe this is lower than bankful. And if this is scour, then maybe this is higher than bankful. Or maybe you can have scour below bankful and really just ask a lot more questions related to uh, uh, what bankful was. So I really appreciate that from from Trevor. Uh, let's see. I have a... All right. So uh, one of the first regional curves that I ever worked on was a regional curve um, in uh, the Piedmont of North Carolina. And the Piedmont regional curve in North Carolina uh, had been pretty much completed um, right before I was hired into North Carolina State University working under Greg Jennings uh, and others. Uh, Greg Jennings had just come back to NC State, and um, we started to have some big questions about the uh, Piedmont Regional Curve in North Carolina. And the Piedmont Regional Curve uh, was essentially um, showing a threefold channel enlargement. And I will display this just for people. I wasn't playing on this, so it might take me a couple seconds. But uh, th this was a, uh, 
So we'll get there eventually. Uh, so it's showing three full channel enlargement. That three full channel enlargement wasn't that much different than what Schuler et al. in 1992 had kind of figured would be ha happening uh, with a channel enlargement. So essentially what this is saying is the same as what, um, you know, I think Morgan was suggesting is, hey, how can it, how can you not have a channel enlargement? Um, and uh, so this is going to kind of start me down a little bit of a journey of thankfulness here. Um, and uh, we got to share my screen and then we'll hit the races here. Share. All right. So this is a, a presentation that we're sharing here, but uh, um, I'm not going to go over all the things. But essentially, when I started um, in North Carolina, I was told that, you know, Schuler et al. and the Center for Water Safety Protection, Protection would show that you had about a three times increase in cross-sectional area based on urbanization. So basically you're gonna have more discharge based on urbanization, which is kind of like a no-brainer. Um, and from that, we identified bank full sites in urban environments in North Carolina and showed about three times larger channel in an urban environment than a rural environment. Um, and in the early 2000s, we started to look at, okay, well, let's have people design for both the urban and the rural regional curve. But what we started to see is that we had a lot of failures when people were designing this urban regional curve and, uh, you know, identify bankful by different features. And Greg Jennings in, in 2007 um, wanted to look at all the regional curves that were available in North Carolina at the time and start to look at what was significantly different. And we tried to look at what was significantly different just by the y-intercept um, and this y-intercept uh, for the regional curves in metric units would be about uh, about 20 times less than what the units would be in English units. So if we saw a unit of 19, you would divide that by 22. And that means our average regional curve in metric units would be 19.5 divided by 22.1 would be about 0.85 uh, times drainage area to 0.71. So we looked at all these different ranges and we looked at the two primary factors of regional curves, the intercept and the exponent. And we tried just did a box plot to try to look at differences. And at this time, uh, uh, Dave Rosgan and others were saying, well, the urban regional curve doesn't make any sense. And he was referencing some paper that uh, Luna Leopold was publishing at, you know, at the time, but hadn't completely published. And he said, well, Luna Leopold's been doing this research and he's going to be publishing these results. And everybody's like, oh, okay, well, we haven't seen this yet. Uh, but they were, there were talks about the urban regional curve not really working real well. Uh, so we started plotting all the differences on regional curves and what makes sense different. And we did generally show that there were three uh, places where the intercept was significantly different. And two of those locations were urban regional curves. Another one was a karst topography, but these were uh, where the intercept or the amount of total discharge per unit area would be significantly higher than what the mean was. And this was just a mean. That's not saying anybody identified bankful right or wrong. Uh, you know, at this time, we were moving towards more bankful high and bankful low based on Trevor's um, uh, mentorship and sharing with us. And we're, we started getting away from the idea of saying, well, you, if you don't know Bankful, you don't know much. We just say, hey, if you don't know Bankful, well, you got uncertainty. Let's try to figure out how we can do a design anyways. And it led us to the idea of different, different geomorphic surfaces that were forming in time, opposed to one predominant geomorphic surface that you can always identify. So in other words, sometimes inner berm is easier to identify. Other times Bankful is easier to identify. Sometimes large storms above the Bankful stage are easier to identify just because they were the last storm that came through the area. Um, so we looked at these multiple features and I won't go over much of this. We broke up these regional curves. Uh, we did the same for the coefficients. And what we saw in Harris County, Texas, and this was a Stantec uh, working on this in 2008 in Harris County, Texas with um, uh, Amex 
AMAC Geomatrix and uh, Lee Forbes at the time. Uh, and uh, what we showed is that we had a bank full feature. Um, can you guys see my my uh, arrow on the screen? I'll assume yes. We had a bank full feature. We had an inner berm feature, but then we also had a feature above the bankful stage. And that feature above the bankful stage was a geomorphic feature, and it was very much affected by the percent impervious, but the bankful feature wasn't significantly larger. And we wondered kind of what this meant. Um, and what we, I'm going to escape out of this. And what we went back to is a research study that had then been published. And uh, I have too many presentations open right now. Um, yeah, let's try this one. All right, so we came up with this, um, this idea of multi-stage multi channels. Uh, and this is what uh, people have been noticing for years is that there is a channel enlargement, but the baneful channel doesn't significantly change because the source sediments that are available to change the sandbox that's available doesn't change gradation. So you still have the only only the same size channels that are able to be moved around by water. Uh, so when it comes to uh, stabilization, unless you hit bedrock, uh, you're still going to have to be stabilized based on the attractive forces of those particles that are available or the available attractive shear forces that can be resisted against related to native vegetation. Uh, so what it ended up being is that we didn't see the channel enlargement that we thought. And this is not unique. Um, well, this is also uh, what Luna Leopold had seen in uh, Watts Branch. In 1953, Luna Leopold um, started research on Watts Branch. And this was gonna be a corridor between Washington, DC and the Northeast. And the whole idea is that they knew it was gonna develop. Uh, this is, I don't know who it is standing in the river there in 1953 in Watts Branch, but this was uh, a dairy farm at the time. And they were putting in a gauge station at the time Luna was uh, chief of the USGS. So he put a gauging station and he was putting together this research and the purpose of the research was so that his grandkids' kids would be able to continue on this research for him. And he had every intent that he'd never see the results of this research uh, and that he wouldn't see a geomorphic change because geomorphic changes would come so slowly, even with urbanization. But he expected that there was going to be a threefold increase in the bankful dimensions. And in 1953, the concept of bankful was very much new. I mean, Luna Leopold and Red Zwolman were kicking around this concept of bankful, uh, but it was really just a concept. They called it bankful because it was the top of the bank. Uh, the first ideas of what bankful was ranged between a 1.1 year storm event and a 200 year storm event. So even the concept of what bankful was, wasn't really true. We weren't talking about inset floodplains of emergent vegetation that could develop into a you know facultative vegetative community. Uh, we were basically just saying, okay, top of bank. Um, so Le Luna Leopold started this, this research on Watts Branch and figuring that he'd be tracking it for years and years and probably have it for the future generations. But he quickly realized that the changes were more rapid. In 1973, he had recognized significant geomorphic shift. And what he expected to see was... In 2001, uh, he documented that his expectation was that he was going to see something about three times larger than what a regional relationship would be. Uh, so he was expecting to see something with that would go from a, a square foot, um, let's say you're here at one square, square mile. He was expecting to see um, a cross-sectional area that would go from about 20 to 30 square foot cross-sectional areas. So he'd go all the way up to 100 to 110 square foot cross-sectional areas. So this was Luna Leopold's own prediction uh, in the 50s. This is where he expected it to go. 
by 19, and sorry, I didn't plan on presenting this today. Uh, by 1973, uh, he noticed that the channel dimensions uh, were not significantly changing in the direction where he thought they would. So in other words, there was an inset floodplain uh, and the channel was getting bigger to the top of bank, but there was developing a smaller floodplain at a lower elevation within Watts Branch. Uh, and this has been documented in a view of the river. So if you ever read the view of the river, there's a whole uh, chapter on Watts Branch, which is super cool. Um, but anyways, uh, and the urbanization from this site went from 140 houses in 1950, and then by 1984, it went up to 2,000 homes. So significant uh, urbanization and no real, no low impact development at this time. Uh, and most of the build out was before the real push for low impact development. Most of these watershed has been built out since 1980 right now. So we had an opportunity with the uh, National Stream Restoration Conference where we had a whole bunch of people that were willing to volunteer time for free and go out and survey Watts Branch and try to see if some of the initial assumptions that Lou Leopold had made in 1953 were correct, or if his revised assumptions in 1973 were correct, or if his analysis in 1994 was correct, or if we just couldn't tell anymore. And uh, this is this represents people from um, uh, three different countries in this picture and uh, four different home offices uh, volunteering their time at a stream restoration conference to go out and survey Watts Branch, which is pretty awesome, by the way. We surveyed, we only spent three hours out there. We surveyed a total of uh, seven cross sections or eight cross sections. Um, and we just tried to identify where the bankful high and bankful low was based on Trevor Chandler's mentorship of us uh, over the years. And we tried to relate that back to the regional curve. And what Luna had shown is that even though the channel was shifting in dimension, and he expected these cross sections to stay in place. And by 1973, he realized he couldn't find a single end pin. Um, and he expected the cross sections to be about the same place, but they kept on moving. But the overall channel dimension did not significantly change. And, and he really thought it would. He thought along the, uh, the thoughts of, of, um, um, of uh, Greg Jennings, Will Harmon, um, and uh, Danny Wise Johnson, uh, and others that worked on the Piedmont Regional Curve back in the early 2000s, that uh, there would be a channel enlargement. And, you know, that's what Shuler et al., uh, 1992, would have been saying too, is that we should see a channel enlargement. And that's what Luna was thinking uh, in the 70s. And then he started realizing that the channel wasn't significantly bigger. There was just filling, there was changing, there was change of location. Uh, here as well. And this exact location was restudied by many because it was also the source of inspiration by uh, Walter and Merritt's at Franklin and Marshall with their legacy sediment research. Uh, so you can go back and look at the research that they had done on floodplain restoration. And this references Watch Branch in the same study location. So what Luna had shown is that the channel dimension didn't change significantly due to the urbanization, even though we thought it should have, or he thought it should have. Uh, location changed, the channel wasn't stable, but the dimension wasn't significantly different. What we did with our volunteers through RiverShare is that since uh, 2000 and early 2000s, Dave Rosgen and others have been kind of picking apart urban regional curves. Um, and making fun of them at classes. And then eventually people get inspired to say, well, let's look at urban regional curves. And since then uh, we've had urban regional curves in about 10 to 12 locations where when we find a bankful feature, the bankful dimension is not significantly larger than the pre-disturbance bankful dimension that would have been synthesized or is available in, in locations nearby. With the caveat of if there's not room for a floodplain to reestablish a at least a minimum width based on stream type or potential stream type, then the only evidence you have of a bankful feature forming is scour, which is at the top of bank, and that is showing a significant sign of enlargement. And that is that's you know when you have scour and you don't have room for a floodplain and deep incision, then you are going to show major enlargement, but you wouldn't design based on that enlargement. So. Based on the data we collected, 
in August of this year with volunteers. Uh, this is the data that we came up with. And what we showed is that it's not much larger than what the Eastern Regional Curve would show. So in other words, we're not seeing significant channel enlargement. Now, we want to be able to publish this data. We want to be able to create, uh, we've talked to two of the authors that are still alive on this original paper. It was uh, Hutman, Miller, and, uh, and Leopold. And uh, we want to be able to republish this paper uh, and have people volunteer their time to republish it in the same names as the original authors just because we think it would be really cool to look at a paper that talks about 40 years of geomorphic adjustment due to urbanization. Uh, and now we have a lot more examples. I know in Charlotte, there's in Mecklenburg County, there's examples of urban regional curves that don't show significant channel enlargement. I know in Orange County, in Orange County, California, there's significant channel enlargement that does not show urbanization. San Antonio, Texas does not show significant urbanization. Um, enlargement does show enlargement in places where you have no floodplain. Harris County, Texas does not show his historic significant channel enlargement. Um, when it comes to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, there was not significant enlargement. Uh, Philadelphia was not significant enlargement. Um, uh, the metro areas of, of Ontario outside of Toronto, we didn't do anything in Toronto, but Brampton and Markham, uh, no significant channel enlargement with urbanization, as Trevor had discussed today. Uh, when we looked at uh, Detroit Metro in Rochester Hills area, no significant enlargement due to urbanization. Um, and uh, that's that's just when you look at Denver Metro, no significant enlargement due to urbanization. Uh, if you have room for a geomorphic floodplain, if you don't have room for a geomorphic floodplain, then it, you will have enlargement. So in other words, if you have enough room to have a stable geomorphic channel at the elevation that you're given, then you can don't have to enlarge the floodplain. You don't have to enlarge the channel. You can just enlarge the floodplain. So that's really what we're trying to push as, as an industry right now is in urban areas, make sure there's room for a floodplain uh, and more access to the floodplain, the better. Uh, but that doesn't mean you, you can undersize the floodplain. It just means once you get to the channel, you don't have to size it for urbanization, the geomorphic channel. So those are some, some thoughts, and that's a lot more information than probably you guys expected today, but hopefully that can be helpful to some people. So, Yeah, I think <clears throat> your caveat about the, the geomorphic floodplain is the key. And a lot of our situations, we're just going deeper and deeper. We're pretty constrained. And it's just, now if you chase that bank full kind of down into the incised overall channel, you'll probably find similar results. So it's just, it's important to the way you explained it, Dave, is, you know, that the caveat you still access a floodplain, maybe the geometry is able to sustain itself. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, in depth, and we we look like what we look at Morgan in a lot of these urban environments. Then is, you know, if you can't have a floodplain, then that's really where you need to go to armor. And like Dan Clinton's talk from a couple of weeks ago, those are the times that you just say, okay, well, we're gonna need more traditional hard engineering approaches. We can't rely on the vegetation with the substrates that are being provided and that are residuals from years and years before development. But that right. was Luna's thought is that we don't get a chance to redevelop the floodplains and give more, give a higher gradation of sediment supply after urbanization because it's already been developed for us over thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so we, that's all we have to work with. So if we can't find stability in that, uh, then we need to move to something harder. Good discussion. But it adds to the thankfulness. I think of, I think of the uh, the way that Luna had documented his research, the way that Rand Woman had documented his research uh, in a way that folks like Dave Rosgen could listen to him, the idea that people would take their time and question regional curves um, in a way that allows people to get better. The idea that people will question what a bank full is uh, and have people look at deposition and scour instead, there's a lot to be thankful for with the way that people have shared in an industry so that hopefully we can get to nature-based solutions 
to be able to be more resilient than uh, you know what we have done in the past as engineers. So. Yeah, this is uh, really interesting. Uh, it's a good topic. It's a very hot topic. Uh, I'd be curious to track uh, further developments and to see um, the, the upcoming uh, results from your study, your recent study, Watts Branch. And, um, yeah, this it's, it's particularly applicable in this age of uh, tables and, and some of the <laughs> monetized design. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Have a have a great week. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. And um, we'll see you next week. Good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, yeah, Trevor. Thanks, everyone. Good. Have, have a good rest of your week. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Josh, are you home this week or are you traveling? Anybody else on the line? I'm gonna end the call unless I hear somebody say, hey, don't end the call. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Have a good day.